Joining me today, Ken Canapan. Ken is an executive vice chair of Plantronics Incorporation, a publicly traded company whose current market cap is approximately $1.8 billion. Plantronics designs, develops, and produces audio solution for call centers, mobile, and gamers. Ken was president of Plantronics between March 1998 to October 2nd, 2016, and CEO from January 1999 to October 2nd, 2016. In the past, Ken served as a senior vice president of investment banking firm Kidder Peabody between 1991 to 1995. Ken has traveled more than 100 countries as business and vacation. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Sanjeev. 100 countries you visited. <laughs> Which one is your favorite country? There's a lot of wonderful places in the world, and uh, you know it's hard to pick a favorite. The truth is, I, I love the U.S. also. Uh, I love the national parks in the West. Uh, uh, I love Kauai; uh, it's so beautiful. Uh, so, if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick the U.S. But I, but I love it all. <laughs> okay, now just talk about uh, plant tonics business. Uh, um, overall. When you talk about Plantronics, there are two major portfolios, consumer and enterprise. Uh, where do you see Plantronics going in the next five years in terms of revenue and growth? Well, first, having retired, uh, let me just say that uh, the current CEO is leading that and should really speak primarily. But sure. I'll just tell you that while I was CEO, we saw very good growth in both the business as well as the consumer side. Uh, you know, um, I would say on the business side that we had growth across the portfolio, contact center certainly, but, but in the office there was a growth in unified communications as people are trying to be mobile and trying to have communication tools wherever they go, using their notebooks, using their laptops and other things like that to, to make calls and to be able to do video, integrate that with IM and other things. At the end of the day, there's no handset attached to a, to a notebook and so you need a headset to provide that audio IO. Um, and there's great opportunity for intelligence. You know, we collect a lot of information. We can make things easier and more intuitive than computers uh, tend to be. On the consumer side, you know, we had saw a tremendous growth in headsets that allow people to drive more safely. States like California that have hands-free laws and many other countries. Uh, that market did decline a little bit, but we had very good growth in other parts of the uh, the market, and we picked up tremendous amount of shares. So we grew, uh, expanding into entertainment, expanding into the opportunity to give people immersion when they're on planes or they're in the office and there's people talking around them, and uh, you know, fitness. People want to go running, and they still want to be able to uh, listen to music, and occasionally take a phone call if one comes up. So we we managed to grow in all those areas. I think one of the big opportunities for Plantronics right now that uh, my successor is working on very hard is soundscaping, and that's an opportunity to control the uh, audio environment with inside buildings, and that's one that the company is is planning to launch later this year. Okay, so when you talk about Plantronics business, the core business headsets, there are many players, especially from uh, a developing nation like uh, China and then uh, Brazil, there are manufacturers all over the world. How does Plantronics compete against those uh, mid to low uh, 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 manufacturers? Uh, obviously when you compare Plantronics, Kager is like 5%. Uh, and then when you compare again uh, Logitech and Motorola, they are negative 3% or 5%. So, so when you look at the five years annual compound annual growth, Plantronics is kind of a solid 5%. Is that the industry trend? Uh, uh, well, actually, I think the trend's better than that. I mean, the truth is if we look at the last however many years, we also had a big negative impact just from currency. So, you know, we used to sell... Uh, Euro was a dollar forty, and it uh, became, you know, a dollar six, a dollar eight. Uh, the pound was much higher, and so if you exclude the the drag on the currency, the actual true organic growth rate was even higher. As I said, you know, we we did have a contraction in the market for um, uh, communications with your mobile phone. Um, but, but the rest of the business was actually growing even faster than that. And I think, you know, to your question on competition, at the end of it, Plantronics produces much better products, and mm -hmm. they don't cost that much more. You know, a lot of the value add that we're providing is in digital signal processing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is code, and not hard cost. So when you buy a Plantronics product, it's just gonna work a lot better. You know, you got a bus going by nearby, people can still hear you clearly. You can still hear them clearly. You get a lot of software integration, so you just put on a Plantronics headset, 
It automatically answers the call. It does a lot of things for you that other products don't do. So, you know, of course, there's going to be a cheaper product than a Plantronics product, but the the relative price to value has always been much better for Plantronics. Sure, I understand. So, as far as the um, the the consumer markets where gaming it's picking up now. Uh, where do you see Plantronics in terms of uh, in virtual reality? Sure, uh, well, you know, we, we launched a uh, product for uh, virtual reality. Those are, uh, you know, they're, they're called uh, headphones or something yeah. like that, but the reality is they are, are really a part of the visual experience and they don't have the audio experience. And when you have really realistic uh, immersive video experience, you want to have the audio that goes with it. So we launched a product for that that's done well in the market. I would also say that gaming in general is uh, very much become a multiplayer thing where mm -hmm. people are playing on teams in these games and they want to be able to talk to their teammates. They want a really immersive experience. They want to feel and experience the game. And in all honesty, they want to win. And so what that means is better audio makes a difference. And so we've gained significant momentum in that market. And we can provide better acoustic solutions so we have a natural competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about uh, uh, the years which when you were CEO, president of Plantronics, um, one of the things I read about you is that you are a firm believer in um, giving a goal to your employees. So that you are, you're asking your employees, not only you should think about company goals, corporate goals, but think about the society and social also. Can you explain what exactly uh, that meant? Sure, well I think that uh, uh, people uh, want to be a part of something that's great. Uh, they, they want to be uh, achieving something. They want to make the world a better place. And part of that for sure is what is the product? You know, our products help people drive more safely. They help people manage their life and stay in touch with uh, uh, both business as well as personal things. So, you know, people can cook and talk to their parents. They can uh, take care of business and be more productive. And so they're important for people. And, and we've got a lot of opportunity there to make people feel happier, more effective, more productive. But they also want to be, uh, in addition to making the world a better place through their products, they want to feel that the organization they're in mm -hmm. is also making the world a better place. I mean, people live in their communities and they want to feel like um, they're a part of an organization that's making a difference. And so uh, we've gotten very strong feedback from people at Plantronics. Uh, you know, that they care about a lot of, uh, of values. They care about the environment. So we, you know, we have, I think, one of the highest solar percentages in terms of power at Plantronics. About 85% of all our power globally uh, comes from solar, including our, our manufacturing plants. We um, did a lot of other things to uh, make ourselves uh, holistic in terms of the wellness of the people at Plantronics. Every location, we have a, a gym. Uh, we, uh, at Santa Cruz, you know, we grow our own produce. We serve it to people two hours later, so there's no pesticides or other things like that in use. It's all hydroponic. Uh, we do a lot of things that, that make it a special place, and we're very involved in a lot of organizations. Those include organizations like Second Harvest Food Bank, where we've contributed, I think, seven million meals or something like that mm -hmm. uh, to help people uh, to Habitat for Humanity, where we've donated a couple homes uh, to uh, charities uh, for uh, uh, orphans in, in Mexico, uh, whatever was needy that the people felt was uh, very valuable. And then we're involved in a lot of community organizations as well. Right. So, so do you see uh, immediate returns from your employees when when they see that employers are going extra mile, do, providing all different kind of facilities, uh, do you see in return uh, a higher efficiency uh, output from your employees? Is that? I think it's the case because you know if you if you read a lot of these surveys and they they surprisingly haven't changed over the years, and mm -hmm. I think Gallup is the one who did them. You know they found out that only about 20 percent of people were actively engaged uh, in their company. 50 percent were neither engaged nor disengaged, and 30 percent were actively disengaged, didn't believe in the company was what it was trying to do. So I think these things all tie together. You know people. Um, they want to they want to not just have a job and a paycheck they're spending so much time in the office they want to feel like the company is doing good things and I'm going of course that includes the product and the customers and how you're taking care of them but it includes other things and so it just builds more trust mm -hmm. it builds more engagement and so yeah you may lose here and there a few hours and some money when you're uh 
uh, putting some time into helping an organization, what you gain back in terms of loyalty for people, in terms of commitment, in terms of reduced turnover, in terms of trust. And the trust goes internally and externally. A lot of your customers, you know, we've known them for decades and they, they trust us. And part of it is people are always getting signals from, from everything you do about how it is that you behave what is your integrity? Are these people I want to do business with? Are these people I trust? And we've ex had exceptional loyalty at Plantronics. Now, contrary to that, we are sitting right now in the middle of Silicon Valley. Uh, there are startups and some of the high-tech uh, companies uh, where work culture is uh, kind of stressful. In smartphone invented now, it's 24 seven. Okay, I have gone through this phase and, and I don't mind taking that stress. So do you consider this uh, invention of this mobile, and then indirectly, Plantronics is also involved with the mobile uh, uh, evolution, right? Uh, do you see that? Is there any relation of the employee relation with the employer, and the stress is building up uh, because of all this technology and innovation? You know, there's always two sides to, to the coin. I think that, um, you know, when I started out in business, when you traveled, you know, you and had a certain amount of time off. You might read on the plane, you might uh, do some in the hotel room, but it wasn't this uh, email, people can reach you all the time, and, uh, and, and that does increase, on the one hand, your ability to get things done, your ability to be responsive to customers, your ability to do things that are good, and to the flip side of, of, of what you said, you know, people have got that with them all the time. They can be reached, they can do work, and, uh, and some of them do, and, it, and it's, a, it's a tough thing. I mean, because you, you want your organization to be fast, you want it to be effective, you want it to be responsive. At the same time, um, for a company like Plantronics, we don't want to burn people out. We don't want to create a high divorce rate because of the stress of the, of the place. We, so, um, and, and you know, what, what you lose by perhaps uh, not pushing people as hard, if you gain that from the knowledge and relationships that people have so that they can have a little more balance in their, in their lives, uh, maintain health, as I say, you know, have a gym, do some other things mm -hmm. that, that can allow them, I think you, you can gain that back. Ultimately, the acid test, again, is uh, do, are you able to keep people and are you able to compete, grow market share, innovate effectively, and if you can do those things, then I think you've got a good okay. balance. So when you were, so how do you identify good versus bad managers? I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it's people who are driving the growth. I mean, you can have all the high tech uh, gadgets, uh, all the good uh, technology around you, but ultimately people are the one who's giving the growth and prospect to the corporation. So how do you identify in your uh, world, how do you identify good versus bad managers? You know, it's a funny thing because when you when you visit uh, a great team, you know it right away, right? I mean, the energy level is really high. They've got phenomenal uh, people want to join that team. Uh, they're coming up with new ideas. They're exciting. They're innovative, and so it's really quite obvious, okay, uh, who the great leaders are in the organization. They're. Uh, their teams are charged up, they're innovating, they're trying to take on new challenges, they're, they're doing more than you even ever asked them to, to, to take on. Uh, we've got a phenomenal leader at Plantronics in our, in our operations, uh, a guy who uh, led our uh, Mexican uh, facility, now head of uh, global operations. You know, he, Plantronics is not the biggest employer in Mexico. And we competed against all these other companies, Daimler, Benz, Microsoft, Google. And I think it's seven years in a row, we won the greatest place to, to work for Mexico. Um, we won the Mexico Quality Award against all these companies. As the winner, we competed against over 50 country winners, including the US Malcolm Baldridge Award, the Deming Award winner in Japan, and we won, okay, against all those. It's a remarkable achievement from an organization. And when you go down there, you get this entirely different world sense. You, you feel like you could eat off the floor, it's so clean. You look around, everybody's smiling. People are bubbling up with ideas. They're constantly trying to find out information to contribute more. Um, you know, at one point in time in 2000, you know, the market was just hot. Mm -hmm. And we had 50 open positions. And we didn't even advertise. And we had thousands of people in line trying to join Plantronics the next day. And a lot of it comes from the culture you've set up. You're listening to people, you're creating an environment where they can contribute more, where they can achieve more, where they feel valued. And, uh, and people love that. And people who set up that, again, it's just, it's just obvious. Okay. 
Um, I want to shift our conversation to SVLG, Silicon Valley Leader Group. I, I had like, two specific questions. One is that um, in Silicon Valley, we do have shortage of a good talents. You know, I mean, whenever I talk with some of the uh, leaders, they say, okay, I can't find a good uh, talent. And there's always talent for between all these companies. Um, how do we solve that? Uh, and then in contrast to that, uh, all the real estate market uh, affordability to live in Silicon Valley, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, I mean, in San Francisco, I just now read a couple of days ago that you need minimum $110,000. That's considered as a low income. So as a part of SVLG, uh, what do you guys promote? I mean, how do you solve this? Uh, uh, it, it may look small, but I think really, these are the leaders. You, you, all of you guys are leaders, and we talked about economic uh, pol policies uh, and education and business. How do you solve this? Well, I think the Silicon Valley Leadership Group is a great organization run by a wonderful man, Carl Gardino, yes. uh, for many, many years. And it concludes many leading companies as well as other organizations like Stanford, like UCSC, uh, hospitals like Stanford, uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation, um, and in many other organizations. Many political leaders are, are active in it um, uh, as well. I think that the organization looks at, at a number of things where it tries to be active and, and promote economic well-being and prosperity in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, those include things that, that you brought up, you know, affordable housing. It's been very active in trying to uh, increase the amount of affordable housing. It's got a foundation that contributes and, and uh, helps uh, create that. It's been very active in, in a variety of environmental policies, including trying to protect and, and preserve the, the risk of, of flooding from, uh, uh, from, from rising water levels. It's been uh, very active in uh, education, uh, STEM, uh, and trying to increase the uh, educational opportunities for minorities and for women. Um, at the same time, it's, uh, to, to some of your other points, it's, it's active in trying to improve the business climate. It's uh, played a prominent role in, in trying to uh, uh, pass the uh, transportation measure. Uh, which will, you know, kind of ease some of the uh, the bottlenecks that uh, that people have had. Of course, those take some time for the funds to actually roll in and mm -hmm. the the, uh, the transportation grid to improve. Uh, working now to try to promote electrification of Caltrain's, which will allow more trains to to come through and increase the uh, the capacity further. Uh, it's worked for, on various other items, uh, including in fed federal level for tax relief. Uh, for sequel reform uh, here at the state level for, for trade. So Silicon Valley uh, Leadership Group is a, is a significant organization. It's well respected, I think, both at the state, local, and at the federal level because people are always interested in what Silicon Valley has to say. And, uh, and again, with a very effective leader and a very effective organization, I think it's been able to influence policy more favorably than it would have been in, in many areas. Okay. Um, so in terms of your uh, the, my question about this uh, talent war, um, yes. because I do see many people coming from all over the world, this H-1B visa, as right. you know that many, many, many uh, software engineers, they come here. And then just recently, uh, uh, Trump administration, they, they have this executive order on this uh, H-1B. So, and I do see that more and more technology coming like Google, Facebook, they are asking for more and more H-1B visa. And how do you find balance in time? Yeah, I think that the Silicon Valley Leadership Group has been in favor of the H-1B program. And, and I think most people who have studied it understand that we're doing a, f a few things that, that can really help the economy grow further. I mean, it's not a zero-sum game where people are mm -hmm. taking jobs away from other people. It's right. a case of if you create more successful businesses, they will actually hire more people. It will help the economy. It will help the, the standard of living here. And you know, in, in many cases, we actually take students from overseas. We educate them at Stanford, at Berkeley, at UCSC, at Santa Clara. And then we don't let them stay. Once they we paid, uh, the United States has paid a lot of the money mm -hmm. for their education. And it's kind of a tragedy because they, they've got those skills, we paid for those skills, and then we won't let them stay, stay here. There are other cases where companies are trying to make products. And you know, if you take a, a, a lot of products, it takes many engineers with different specialties to come together to make a sophisticated, complicated product. You'd hate to find that you couldn't put that entire team together. And then what do you do? You have to outsource the whole thing somewhere else because you lack a few people? 
it's really much better if we can bring some people here to complete those teams and, and do the development here in the U.S. So think of it as, you know, uh, allowing those talents in is allowing you to develop products here. And I think when people understand that, they, they wind up realizing this is really a positive thing mm -hmm. uh, to get the, those talents in the United States. Okay. Let's just shift your, our gear one more time to your personal life. And sure. I'm not going to ask you too many personal questions. Um, you left um, Plantronics uh, as a CEO. Um, and I, to me, you, you're still young. Uh, is there any reasons uh, you, you just uh, resigned as a CEO? Well, I mean, uh, is there any personal so, I, so I, am, I am young. But having said that, I had uh, better than 30 years uh, Pretty hard work, um, and uh, you just got and, exhausted. Huh? And 18 <laughs> years as CEO, and I, I think that that was a good long yeah. stretch as CEO. And uh, you know, it's an opportunity to to do some other things and to uh, enjoy uh, a, a little less. Um, you know, the CEO job is a great job, and yeah. particularly at Plantronics, which is a wonderful company with wonderful people. But there is only one gear; you have to go 110 percent. And I think for me, um, you know, I, I think I was ready to go a little bit um, less. Uh, I'd had a couple of, of cancers, and I think that yeah. it was better for me to go at a slightly lower pace. Yeah. So talking about your, in 2013, uh, you had a treatable form of cancer. What have you learned? I mean, did that change your perspective about life? Uh, Not really. I mean, I, I think that it, it changes your physical stamina just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but... But no, I mean, I, you know, I, I came away from that. People said, geez, do you want to smell the roses? And the truth was, I loved Plantronics. I loved everything else in my life. I was smelling the roses. Um, but it, again, I just kind of reached the, it was the right time, and I, and I wasn't able to go quite hard enough. My successor is a phenomenal guy, Joe Burton, and uh, he was completely ready to be CEO, so it was just a natural uh, transition point. Okay. So you have been with uh, Plantronics for almost, what, uh 18, 18 years? 18 years as CEO and about 22 20, 20, in total. 20, yeah. yeah, 20 dollars. Okay. How do you define success? I mean, is this something, what's important for you? I mean, uh, maybe our viewers would, can learn from you that you have reached to this high uh, in your career. Is, it, is there any personal, uh, did, did you have any mentor while you were growing up? Uh, what, what defines you as a successful man? Well, those are a lot of different questions. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I think that, you know, success is... Um, is for each person, however they feel about success. Okay, mm -hmm. so when you when you look at um, success in your family, you know, on the one hand, you want to have a great uh, feeling of of love and happiness in the family, but you also want your kids to be happy, um, and you want you want that to be sustained. When you look at success uh, at a company in a position like Plantronics, you know, of course, there, there's a number of yardsticks. Again, you know, you you want. Uh, to have felt like you made a difference and moved the ball in terms of customers. You want to feel like you've made money for your shareholders because that's what they, they wanted you to do, okay? And and hopefully along the way and as part and parcel of that, a lot of the people who are working there did, did well as well. I think you want to feel like, uh, you know, you, you've made an impact in the community. Um, so I think that there's a whole bunch of measurements that you, you want to look like and, and, you, and at the end of the day you want to feel like there was some really great innovations, some, some new things that we did, we experimented, we pushed the boundaries, and, and, and we made the world a better place. Tell us about while you were growing up in your college life, any interesting thing which our view, which nobody knows it, only this <laughs> interview will. Uh, when you were growing up, did you have any mentor, uh, any interesting college uh, episode which has made you? I mean, did you always knew that? Did you always know that you will be in management? I mean, you have. So I had no idea. The okay. truth is that uh, when I was in college, I rode crew, uh, yeah. and uh, it, you know, like many people who did it in college, it was pretty much three hours in the morning, four hours in the afternoon every day. And uh, my parents were actually both really in ac academia. And I'd, I was pretty sure I was not wanting to write any more papers, study any more tests. And um, I was actually planning to go out for the uh, national team and crew and uh, uh, thought I would probably do pretty well. And then I broke a thumb. And of course, you have to hold the oar. And I decided, you know, I didn't really want to spend a year trying to support myself. I had a lot of loans and things like that. Uh, and uh, so I needed to get a job at that point in time, and, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And it took me 
quite some time um, before I figured out that I really wanted to be part of building a company. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point in time, I approached my management at the time. Kidder was owned by GE, and they gave me some courses at Crotonville, and they did some other things to, to prepare me for that. GE wound up selling uh, Kidder, so that went away, but, but I still had had paved the way a little bit, and when it was sold, I, I got some opportunities. Okay. Uh, we are running out of time. Just 30 seconds. What next for you? I mean, what's your future plan? Something well, we should know. <laughs> no, I'm, I, in all honesty, I've, I've been transitioning with my successor, and I'm, and I'm trying to figure out now exactly what I will do next. There's a number of things that have popped up, and I'm still investigating them, so it's premature to say. Okay. Ken, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming down to the show. Thank you, Sanjeev. Ken. Appreciate it. Thanks.